BJ from Game Gumbo, got my guest here, Josh from Travel Buddy, Tr Travel Buddy Games, and we are talking spicy hot games and a spicy hot game that you are probably super ecstatic funded almost right away, and that's the Great Barrier Reef card game from Travel Buddy Games. All right, Josh. Woo, that, that's a great game. <laughs> right. That's a spicy game. You've got the chat crew right here. Give us the elevator pitch. Tell us about the game. Who designed it? How'd you find it? What's the game all about? Uh, so Keith Pickett designed this game, uh, and he and he pitched it to us at a convention Keith Pickett, um, you said. last year. Yeah, I am. Um, honestly, I'm. I'm. He. I've. Keith and Keith and I have known each other for uh, for a while from you know doing pitch meetings at, at conventions and him showing me stuff for Gray Fox. So I'm actually trying to remember if he pitched this to me at a show or if he just sent it to me afterwards. Um, but as as soon as he sent me the the rule book for it, I knew that this was a, a clever system. It's got overlapping cards, um, which I like very much, uh, kind of a la Hanshu. Um, Ooh, but it also, yeah, me too. It also has this mechanism that I've never seen anywhere else, which is the way that the market is resolved in this game. So when you're playing this, um, when you're playing the Great Barrier Reef game, the goal is to, to arrange the fish in a particular pattern. And so at the start of the game, you'll get random scorecards that tells you, hey, this fish wants to be in a block. This fish wants to be in diagonal lines. This fish wants to be in an L shape. Um, and your goal is to create those patterns in order to in order to score points. And every time you create the pattern, you, you multiply at the end game by whatever the scoring is at for that condition. So that's the puzzle overlaying part. The market part is that each of those cards has a number in the center, and that tells you what spot in the market you draw your replacement card from. And so this leads to some really interesting decisions in that- Well, you're not you know, kidding. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm playing a card because it makes that pattern, and it doesn't matter what I put in my hand, except that's in my hand now, and I have to figure out how to use it. Sometimes I actively want a particular card, and if I can't make my pattern using that card, I got to find a way to play it in my reef anyway, so I can get the thing I want for the future. It's and a stupidly you know, the, the taste decision when you're trying to decide between those two things. Now the stars make it helpful because if I remember right, that's the wild part, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and they uh, all be wild, uh, Keith. <laughs> you're killing me with those decisions, man. No, you you be honest. There's a juicy card that you really want, but it's the wrong number. But you, ah, I really want this card. And and those lead to good moments, right? I mean, like sure. I I love those kind of stories at the end of a game about the risks I took and when they paid off and when they didn't. And if I want that card bad enough, I will break a pattern I've already made to pick up the card that I want so that I can fix it later. And if I fix it, who boy did I come out ahead? And if I never put, get to draw into that position, well, I might have just cost myself, you know, six, eight, ten points, and then where will I be? Um, but but that yeah, picture I, mean, I showed you earlier was a picture of, uh, of a game between me and my nephew playing it on Tabletopia, I think, if I remember right. And one of the things that we talked about after the game was the, the push-pull when we were fighting over the little markers on each one of the market cards. And that's, that's just another – for such a small box game, it's got these big decisions in it. How did Keith do that? Yeah, I mean, he's he's got a knack, <laughs> and uh, and the other designs I've seen from him have had have had similar presentations of simplicity with complexity hidden underneath. Um, and that's that's something that I want to go for for Travel Buddy Games. I want these to teach really easily, right? I have a single page rule book. I want you to be able to teach us in a couple of minutes, and that's great. But I also want the gamers who are you know instrumental in in helping support these projects to have a game that they're not going to play once or twice and then feel like they've played it out i mean i want games to have enough depth that you're going to play this you know dozens or hundreds of times and feel like there are still meaningful decisions to be made and i think this game does that <laughs> all right so one of the things i can't get from the tabletopia and and, and josh by the way Everybody in the chat crew, if you want to play it, there's availability on TTS and on Tabletopia right now, right? You've got yep. you've got some versions. But one of the things you don't get the flavor from is how portable is this game? I know that was important to you. How, how are you going to pull that off? Because there's a lot of stuff inside this box, it looks like. Although I will tell you, the rule book was small. That's the game, right? <laughs> That's the game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a small box. Smaller than Innovation, smaller than Tissue. Um, smaller than Anoint Games box. Uh, the, the game is... The game is is Compared you know uh, or small, smaller than that, right? Pocket Mars, little smaller than that. 
Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's got, um, five, five punch board tokens and, you know, a big old, old stack of cards and then five of those cool little coral markers and then a, a little score pad. Hey, Chris, um, we're talking the great barrier reef card game from travel buddy games out on Kickstarter right now. You probably know Christian strain. From uh, I do. from doing his, uh, of course, uh, you know uh, the troubles game, but also for the stuff he does for Gray Fox game. But tonight we're talking Travel Buddies games, Chris. Chris, Chris did the uh, graphic design for Reavers of Midgard. Sure did. Yep, Reavers of Midgard. Right. Looks incredible. Um, but yeah, the great the Great Barrier Reef uh, card game is it's gonna it's gonna fit in your pocket. Uh, I want you to easily put it in your backpack. I want you to easily put it in your carry on. Um, and I want you to get a lot of mileage out of this game, both in terms of actually taking it with you when you travel and in terms of replayability. And we're we're going to do everything we can to make sure all of our games have the smallest footprint possible so that it is easy for people to throw them in their bag and go. All right. You know the shorts I'm talking about. Shorts that have the big front pockets and the big pack pockets. This is one that I can unbutton that front, front pocket, slip it in, put it in the front pocket of my backpack put it in the front little tiny pocket of my uh, of my carry-on, right? You're a carry-on guy, I'm assuming, when you travel. It's just a tiny, yeah, little, a tiny little 20-inch carry-on, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've, and, I've and done 10 days in Europe with a 20-inch carry-on. What were you going to say? I said you can you can fit this in any one of those any any one of those places and still have room left over. I um now if if you're a woman, you're not going to be able to put them in your jean pockets because people don't make pants with pockets that women can use. They're all decorative. It's decorative, yeah. I don't understand that. My wife complains about that all the time. Yeah, so well, she's right to be annoyed by it. Every time we go out, my my wife wants to travel late. She's like, "Can you please carry my ID? I can't fit this in the pocket of my pants." And I'm like, "That's ridiculous." And sure. So you busted through a bunch of of the uh, stretch goals I saw. What's up next? If if I remember right, you've got a couple of pretty cool upgrades for the Kickstarter, right? Yeah, we've we've unlocked um, we've doubled the amount of scoring cards in the game, um, which adds a crazy amount of variety and replayability. And now we're working on upgrading uh, components and making the game look and feel as good as possible. Uh, so the next thing we're doing is the is the spot UV upgrade for the box. Um, board gamers know what that is, and I want this to be a game that really kind of pops to your eye and pops off the shelf. Um, I think uh, we've managed to get no small portion of people who aren't generally board game backers on the campaign, which I'm really excited about. Um, and I'm, I hope that when they get delivered a product that looks as good as this does, that they're, you know, as proud to have it as we are to make it. We want to make sure that this looks like a, a premium product and we deliver a lot of value to our backers because this was a, this was a Kickstarter in the, in the truest sense of the word. There is, there is no retailer waiting to stock this game. There is no distribution network waiting to hold on to it. This was a fund or die endeavor. Um, and without the people who backed it, we couldn't make it. And we're really thankful that so many people are excited for it. Kelly's one of the backers out there and she says, we need women's cargo pants. But if she wants a copy of the game, it's she really don't take a chance. It's really the Kickstarter where you need to get it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're gonna print um, enough to fulfill this Kickstarter and you know some extra in hopes that we can find a market for this afterwards. Obviously, I'm going to be able to sell it through my website, and I'd love to find opportunities to get it into retail. But um, you know, this isn't a this isn't a Gray Fox project. I have contacts in the industry, and I and I hope that will help me moving forward. But you know, from game designer to publisher is a is a leap, and there are there are no guarantees about where this game will end up. So. Um, you know, the, the way to get it is, is now. <laughs> sure. Somebody behind you at your door trying to get in. Who is that? Somebody trying to get in. What, what is going on there? <laughs> there. Oh my God. It's Keith. Keith. Thank you. Hey, Keith. Hey, Keith. Hey, Keith. Welcome, hey, what a surprise. Oh man. Welcome to the show. Yeah, we'll be surprised with that. So Keith, we're talking about uh travel buddy games, your game uh, with um, uh, the great, Barrier Reef card game. And one of the questions that Thomas had was, how was the pitch between the two of you? Were you Did you have a small card game and hear about Travel Buddy games? Mm -hmm. Or was this just conversational between you and Josh? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd pitched a game to Josh for uh, Gray Fox. So I'd met him uh, you know, a couple of years before this. And so kind of had him as a contact. And then I was following along with what he did and saw the uh, Travel Buddy games. And I happened to have a game that just kind of fit perfectly. So I think it was I emailed in to you before uh, it was uh, it's before um, like back in March of last year, I believe. 
And yeah, it just kind of went from there. So it just happened to be a really good fit for it. Josh, was it always about the Great Barrier Card Game uh, Reef, or or did you see an opportunity with a cool game system to bring in something from an you know for Joel for us exotic? I know it's your back door, but for us, it's exotic. We we didn't have to deviate much, right? When when Keith pitched it, it was it was a game about uh, keeping an aquarium, and mm -hmm. so there was there was fish uh, already. Uh, going into the patterns that they were in, and we just we brainstormed together on how we could um, repurpose the system somewhere else. Um, Great Barrier Reef was one of the options. Bird Bird Cliffs of Norway was something yeah. we kicked around for a little while too. Um, okay, but <laughs> but Reef Reef is what stuck, uh, and part of that might have been because of its original theme. It wasn't that far off, and uh, the changes that we made were were only very few. I mean the. The development on this game was was quick and easy, and the thematic changes were to scrap some things that uh, that you might find in an aquarium but wouldn't find in the ocean and replace them with life native to the place where we wanted to feature the game. <laughs> and you're in the middle of doing all these scuba diving lessons, so you had to think, oh, my God, this is like this is like karma just raining down on me. This is great here. One of the things it, I wanted to ask you. Brain, but uh, for whatever it's worth, scuba diving in the Midwest uh, is not quite so as exotic as scuba diving in the reef. <laughs> yeah. Is. So Keith, one of the things we were talking about before you got on was the the tension that is in the game mm -hmm. that, that you find in two or three different parts, and and the most tense, of course, is that push pull on the scoring of the points, but also right. picking the carts from the market and then deciding. Mm -hmm. What am? How am I going to screw myself by covering the things I need, <laughs> or covering the things I don't want, which is better for me? That's three right. different things. Were there even more tension points, and you had to pare them down to that, or 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 was this something you upgraded, or or was it out of the box? I'm going to have two or three really crunchy, juicy decisions in a tiny little package. Now this is one of those kind of once I had the um, the mechanic with playing a card and determining which card it it brought into your hand, which. I played around with a few ideas with covering a different quadrant determined what card you brought into your hand and things like that and eventually went with the numbers but once that came together and this it actually came together pretty quick so um this game was originally called aquascape and actually i started working on it years and years ago and it was a much different game but went through many iterations but once i kind of landed on this final one it, it came together pretty darn quick Alex had a good question. Alex Goldsmith from, uh, from the Dukes of Dice. He wanted to know a, 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 a question appropriate for either one of you. all What game most inspired you, Keith, that that kind of outlined the developmental direction for Great Barrier Reef? Was there something that you said, oh, this is a cool idea. Let me see if I can twist it and change it and put my own spin on it. Yeah, I loved uh, I love Circle of Wagons and Sprawlopolis and the, the Steve Aramini and Danny Devine and those guys, the games that they've done. So definitely that card lay layering. Um, I just wanted to kind of take more of a, uh, you know, Circle of Wagons is a two-player game. Sprawlopolis is a really good solo game. I know you can play it with more players, but I wanted something with that same feeling that was also a bit competitive. So that's kind of where I was going with this one. Josh, is this is this too cutthroat for a travel game that you're introducing to your partners in a hostel in the middle of, uh, you know, Romania? Or, or is this friendly enough to bring to people that have never played games before. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's friendly enough. Okay. Honestly, I do. I, I mean, some the the only sort of direct player interaction is when when you play a shark and bump up a scoring thing that you're going for and bumping down something else that someone is going for. And one of the things that I love about this game is that nothing ever gets you nothing. If you've made a pattern, it will pay you. Right when you when you even if your opponents if everybody at the table gangs up on you and runs your stuff straight down to the bottom, none of those things are worth zero. You'll always get something. Okay, right. um, and honestly, I I love this design because you you get out of it what you put into it. I can sit down and play this game in twenty minutes with somebody who is a who is into lighter games, or I can play the same game in. 40 minutes with an opponent who wants to really get crunchy and grind it out and make the optimal moves. And so it it fits it fits that thing that I'm going for, and I'm absolutely confident I can throw this in my pack and teach it at a hostel. Um, it's a litmus test for the games that we sign. So Keith, uh, <laughs> yeah, good. Keith, one of the things that uh, the name file and I were talking about the other night, we played Concordia, and one of the cool mm -hmm. things about Concordia is Euros get a, a terrible reputation for having no interactivity. But a good Euro 
actually has the kind of interaction that doesn't what what Josh said the the no zero thing, where you knock a person off of their route, knock them off right. a peg a little bit, and then they've got to steer around that. That steer around is actually a fun part of the game if you can pull it off. It's it's kind of satisfying when somebody throws a roadblock and you're able to get around it. So there is player interaction, and I think you pulled that off, Keith. Was that what you were going for here in 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 the interaction between the players? Definitely, yeah. I didn't want something too mean and in your face, but it's. It's one of those games where if somebody you're going after a certain pattern of fish and then you realize that everybody's ganging up on you and trying to knock that one down, you can you can pivot and you know go to another route and see what they're doing and try to piggyback off of what they're doing and try to increase your score that way. So hopefully, you know, there's there's good player interaction, but it's not a it's not a completely mean game. And like Josh said, you're always scoring points. So if you do something, if you have you get a pattern together and it all comes together, you're getting something for it always. So, Josh, tell us a little bit about the uh, Kickstarter. How many days left do we have on the Kickstarter? Uh, we got seven days left. We're at the one one week mark here, so it's going to wrap up next Tuesday. We're in, into that home stretch. 